thank you a lot for your invitation. Um, I'm really happy to be to be with you <clears throat> for speaking on this uh, last research. Uh, this research is obviously not over. It's just the beginning of a research because since we published with Patrice Bouvret, the co-author uh, writer, uh, we received some new informations and uh, also we, we do a lot of advocacy to the parliaments to have in the French parliament to have more information um, that I will explain that. I want also to, to use this time to, to thank the Heinrich for Stiftung and Giorgio Franceschini to give me the opportunity to, to, to work on, this, on these questions. As you're probably aware, um, France realized between the 60s to 1996, 210 nuclear atmospherics and underground tests. This is the larger number of tests carried out by a state after USA and USSR. 17 were realized in, uh, in Algeria, in the Sahara, south of Sahara, between 1960 to 1966, um, in two different test zones, named Reagan region and also Inikir. What is really important, and a few people mentioned that or think about that, is that on the 17th test, 11 uh, came after 1962 uh, Avian Accord, which opened the road to the independence of Algeria probably around 150,000 soldiers, Algerians, Tahitians, uh, French civil workers participate to all of this experience, so in, in Algeria and in Polynesia. And we have an estimation of 24,000 in for the Sahara. We need to imagine that when the French arrived in 1966 and 1967 in, in Regan, um, well, it was the desert, nothing was there, and everything was necessary to build to, to create the future uh, nuclear test site. So they built road, military camp, runaway, um, also big swimming pool for the soldiers because they stayed two or three years. Uh, so that's also one of the reasons why when the, the left, we, we have so many ways. Um, on the 17 year explosions, uh, some experience worked and some of those didn't work so well. And I think particularly to, to uh, four nuclear uh, underground explosions named Beryl, Amethyst, uh, Ruby and Jad. You have the different details on the, on the report. These tests, uh, tests were not completely contained or confined, resulting in the release of radioactive gas, aerosol, and lava into the environment. Until the 90s, uh, the silence remained on what happened in the zone. The French government always denied accidents, always denied the effect on the environment or on the populations and on the French soldiers and or the fact also that some fallout affected the whole European continent and even um, across Sweden. So if today we have a better knowledge of nuclear test accidents and their consequences, because since 2010, we have also a law recognized some problematic, there is still a lack of key information as to the existence of large quantity of nuclear and non-nuclear waste to ensure the safety of populations and environmental remediations. So this study is really a first answer, an initial answer to the 1997's parliamentary reports um, that evaluating uh, the nuclear waste and the nuclear radio radiological test sit in the Sahara. And they quote in 1997, there is no precise data on the issue of waste materials which could have resulted from the series of experiments conducted in the Sahara. So we tried to give an answer for the first time. Obviously, and I will not go on this topic, this study is also directly linked with the Article 6 and 7 on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which now enter into point since three days now. Our report is based on testimony that we receive from former actors, soldiers and Algerians actors, because uh, my co-writer went on the Sahara in 2008 and in 2010, and we have friends or been there a few years ago too. And also uh, most important unclassified document that we have and that we can work on that, uh, we obtain by different way. Um, this report really explain and categorize the waste 
that France left behind, or as I wrote inside the report, bring, bring in the sense as the desert was regarded as the sea of sand. And this way to see the environment explains also why France between 1972 and 1982 dumped a minimum of almost 3000 tons of nuclear waste close to Morura and Fogatofa. So they really use the same policy in the Sahara than in Morura. They didn't create some trench in Morura, but they just dumped everything in their cells. So if I go directly to the, to the details, because it's what it's most important, uh, we categorize the waste into three, three, three categories. The non-radioactive waste, related, mainly related with the French occupations uh, and to the, with the dismantling of the seat in 1966, 1967, and also with the presence of the Algerian army, because the Algerian army um, decide to occupy the seat when the French remove uh, to see what happens, uh, to use also the different building, and also something that is really um, not known uh, in the 90s, they use also some of the building of, the, of this area has a prison for the people who were involved with the revolution or with the movement against the government in the 90s. This non-radioactive waste, so the first category, is mainly composed with hundreds of metal drums and probably bitumen, and uh, also with a metallic waste contaminated or not by the radioactivity. Um, a large majority of this metallic waste now uh, were removed or uh, were used by the populations. They use that as for the for the house or they even sell it. Uh, so that's a real interrogation if these metals were contaminated or not, or if they create some health problem or not. We also have two enormous bunkers, and one of them was named Sphinx. Um, that are completely impossible to destroy because it will require to, to greater resource. Uh, but uh, they are now almost under the sands and it would be really important that these structures are officially located for the future generations of archeologists. Well, the second um, categorized is the contaminated materials that the French deliberately buried into the sand. And that's what the, the most important. After many research on, um, on uh, secret uh, official documents and some testimony, we find a note entitled Contaminations of Tooling Equipment, which is also in the report. And this note, as you know, in France, we are very an administration uh, state. Everything should be written about what you use or not use, about what you need to buy again or not buying. So this note, really, uh, which is, was emitted by the air testing group, explain that they need to bury some screwdriver, uh, for example. And that's the proof that France have a real policy to, um, to bury everything who could be contaminated uh, by radioactivity. So it goes from a common screwdriver, as I say, to planes and tanks that are, were used for atmospheric um, uh, tests. So everything that have may been contaminated by radioactive activity had to be buried. So we know that somewhere in the French secret documents, they have a lot of notes with everything we describe, which each document, which, which two that we used during seven years. Um, we know that a lot of planes, how we show some pictures that uh, were used for uh, all the planes that went inside the fallout to, to take some samples, other planes that then we use on the ground to see how they resist, or cars also to see how they resist to the explosions, were cut and put inside massive trench, as we show some with some pictures on the on the report. Um, maybe one of the main problem on this waste is not just the trench, uh, because we don't know where they are. Um, we have also, I think it's the major problems, a collection of other radioactive waste that are huge big tanks that they will use um, where they do some radioactive experience with bullet of plutonium. And we know that they buried that somewhere. And that's a massive uh, security problem and in terms of obviously environment, but also in terms of health problems. 
The third category is the radioactive materials emitted by nuclear explosions. And this one, it's probably the most complicated waste because we know that it would be just impossible to remove it. Um, but there is some a lot of action that we, we can do it. Um, these categories include the waste like vitrified sands, radioactive slaves, lava that were created by different atmospheric nuclear tests and also by some undergrowth uh, nuclear tests that are, were not confined. Notably, the most important one is named Beryl in May 1962 and Amethyst uh, in May in uh, 1963. <clears throat> this waste stemming from the physical reaction of the fissile materials contained in the nuclear device, an object in the surrounding area, in, partic in particular sands and structures like towers, machinery. For example, we know in the zone of the Amudia atmospheric atmospheric state sites, the ground is covered in black fragments of vitrified sand, which result look like, like a leopard skin. You have black and white. And it's completely impossible to remove it. And which we know also that the wind probably uh, pushed these sands everywhere in the desert. Also, according to some official data that we have in this um, secret documents that we publish, the contaminated buried zone originally was equivalent of 250 hectares, which is massive zone. Um, and it's on the mountain side of the Tanefala. So it's also very complicated to go and very complicated to, to remove. But it's not so far from a, one of the main roads who go to Taman Raset. So it's also a huge problem. So based on some of our independent scientific uh, researcher, that analyze the lava, uh, this lava is highly contaminated and very dangerous due to a high level of cesium-137 cesium cesium contaminations. So these three kinds of, of waste really show that France have a policy to bury everything, to let everything behind uh, in the contest uh, against the Algerian, uh, I would say, uh, policy and without any, um, any thought about also the protection of the, the environment. One of, by, we have different recommendations of Russia on this report. And one of the most important is that France explain and show the map to the Algerian authorities with the full list of sites where contaminated waste were buried. Last week, um, we arrived to obtain a major, uh, a major uh, result of our report because uh, a report was uh, realized by uh, an historian specializing in colonizations named Benjamin Stora. He, he gave a report to uh, Emmanuel Macron that he ordered uh, in, uh, in last December. And Benjamin Stora uh, used one of our recommendations to explain where France dumped, uh, where France burning the materials and to release this uh, famous map with all the trench. We know that a lot of French uh, MPs, parliamentarians actually work on that topics and uh, ask uh, ministers of defense, ministers of foreign affairs, ministers of foreign environment to release and publish some documentations. Since we published this report, we have also a lot of talk with the Algerians um, ministers and diplomacy that he would like to have more information. And they really use these informations inside also the TPNW. So I don't want to go too far on, on that point. But maybe the most important and that we can have some more um, in some more uh, action in the future is that the, the ICIC um, located in Algeria decide to work now on these topics and will begin to, uh, to create um, a report about the health sanit conditions in this zone which would be good because actually we don't have any information about the conditions of the populations. Uh, they would try to recollect it, some testimony about uh, different um, uh, different persons who participate to this uh, to this uh, to this um, to this experience or to have some information. So this is where we are actually. Uh, it's just an initial um, an initial report because we, we we obtain some new information that we are going to to use in the future. Um, we expect it to go in uh, in Algeria in the coming months, but with the pandemics, 
it's a little complicated as you can imagine. Uh, but the good things is that we know that the pressure is on the shoulder of France now, and we have the expectations to have some, uh, some new, not only the map where the, the trench will realize in the coming months. So maybe I would stop there uh, uh, and uh, I will hope to have some questions and thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Jean-Marie, and thank you for being mindful of time. Um, I think you touched upon very important issues. You know, they're, they're also one of them is, which brings, um, got my attention, the secrecy, you know, surrounding the nuclear test and how it really impedes with the research, which could be done on the uh, consequences uh, on the uh, humans. And um, it, it's very typical to uh, other countries, for example, Kazakhstan, where uh, over 400, uh, 456 uh, tests were conducted and um, uh, there was uh, not much information available on the uh, damages to the environment and people. But uh, so um, can you stay until the end or do you need yeah, to? For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I suggest we save questions for the end, if that's okay with everybody. Um, and uh, again, thank you so much. That is, I'm looking forward to reading your report. Um, so, and Doug, please, um, uh, uh, you could take the floor and we are looking forward to your presentation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, uh, I started out working on uranium mining in, in the United States, uh, especially in the South, Southwest with the Navajo people. I won't, I won't talk much about that, but, um, but eventually was drawn into some work about uranium mining in Africa uh, through the uh, International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, uh, the chapters in uh, Switzerland and Germany. And, uh, and at the end of the talk, I'll... I'll, I'll uh, I'll tell you about the three trips and the three conferences that they hosted there that I participated in. Um, so the first thing that I, I want you, I want to convey is that uh, for a long time, uranium mining was dormant uh, worldwide. There was very little uranium mining. There was plenty of uranium that had already been mined. There was a glut. Uh, the, the price for uranium was so low that it really didn't make sense to do very much mining. And then in the, uh, around uh, 2007 to 2010, and then afterwards, there was a, a spike initially, which I think was, was speculation rather than, than reality. And then an elevated uh, price for uranium, which was mostly based on this idea that there would be a nuclear renaissance, that, um, that the, the uh, climate change problem required nuclear power and so there would be a, a, an effort to build many, new, nu many nuclear power plants. And then there would, in turn, that would lead to a, a, a market for uranium, a renewed market for uranium. And that continues to some extent. It's leveled off. I, I don't have the data here after 2015. Um, but I think the excitement about that possibility has, has, has weakened over time, uh, especially after Fukushima. Uh, and, um, and especially, I think, also because it's turned out that building nuclear reactors might be possible in China and India and some other places, but in, the, in, in Europe, in Japan, in the U.S., uh, it's very difficult. They're very expensive. Uh, they remire, require massive government subsidies. The regulatory framework is, is, is very is prohibitive. So I think it's, it's something that's declined. But it, um, it raised the concern that uranium mining was, was coming back. And uh, when that happened, uh, historically, uranium mining had happened, uh, again, as was just mentioned, in, in Kazakhstan, in Eastern Europe, in Canada and Australia especially, a lot in the United States, which is what I worked on, some in, in, in Southern Africa and, and, and Niger. Uh, but it, it hadn't focused on Africa so heavily uh, yet. But, but uh, by, that, by the uh, early 2000s or 2010, uh, the regulatory climate in the US was, was dead set against uranium mining. It continued in Australia, Canada, Kazakhstan, but, uh, but not in Eastern Europe. So, so there was a, a fear that, that the, in, in, the, in looking for new uranium to mine, that it would move to Africa. It never was much in South America. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, despite uh, Africa being a, a fairly small source of uranium historically, uh, it, uh, uh, Africa has very large 
uh, uranium waste uh, deposits, especially in, in Namibia and, and South Africa. And that is because the uranium in those places is low grade. In South Africa, it's mostly a secondary product of gold mining. And so you have very large amounts of waste. Uh, and, and I saw this in South Africa, I'll say more about it later, uh, uh, left over from this gold mining that, that is contaminated with uranium and uranium de uh, decay products. So, so even historically, even without another boom of uranium mining, Africa has, Southern Africa at least, has a disproportionate burden of, uh, of uranium waste, of uranium mine tailings. Now, I should mention uh, all these slides up until my, my personal photos of my trips to Africa uh, come from an article that we published a few years ago, 2017, in the Journal of, Af of African Earth Sciences. Frank Wind, who is from South Africa, was the lead author, and um, others in Europe uh, who are part of International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War were also co-authors on this. And, and I can make this article available if there, there are people in this course uh, who would like to look in it, into it more deeply. Frank, in, in particular, deserves tremendous credit. He took the lead on this article. And he just had deep, deep knowledge of uranium mining in Africa at a level that, that greatly exceeds exceeded my own when we wrote that, but exceeds my own uh, to this day. So again, uh, uh, Africa is you know, less than 20% of the historical uranium mining, but uh, Europe and North America are closed down. The, the mining is largely stopped there. And so, so it's moved to, um, well, North America is in, continues in Canada, not in the US. Europe is pretty much closed down. Asia, especially Kazakhstan, and, um, and then Australia, and then Africa is the next, the next frontier. And from a, from a social fairness and justice standpoint, um, uh, it's important to understand that, that, that even at the level of uranium mining that's happened in Africa, that, that Africa is one of the places where there is mining, but very little use of uranium. There's one or two nuclear power plants in Africa and South Africa. Uh, it's not a nuclear powered continent, uh, uh, nor is South America. But uh, the, the uranium mined there is going uh, 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 to places like, uh, like Europe, and especially uh, France, as we just heard, uh, with the historical uh, relationship to Africa and 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 uh, uh, the company Areva that runs much of the nuclear in, in France uh, gets its uranium in Africa is, is a good example. So, um, so where's Africa? I'm sorry, Africa is here. So a net exporter, Asia, Africa, Australia, net exporters, Europe, North America are importing uh, uranium. Uh, Despite that, uh, Niger, as I said, has two of the top 10 largest uh, uranium mines in the world. Um, uh, I don't know, this could probably be updated. This is from 2008, but I think those mines are still, still active. I think they're still very large. But the real concern in Africa, and, and that is a legitimate concern in and of itself, what is the impact of existing uranium mining in Niger? of the gold mining and uranium extraction in South, South Africa and, and, and Namibia. I'm sorry, I didn't highlight Namibia is the other one here. Um, uh, that historical impact is something that we would be interested in, but the initial, but the real concern we had was that there would be an expansion of uranium mining across Africa uh, at the time that we began looking into this. That hasn't happened so much and I'm beginning to think that the, the trend toward more nuclear power is, is not going to be very strong. And, and again, as I said earlier, I think the economic pressure against it and the regulatory standards are probably the, the main uh, block. Uh, I would say again that uh, China and India might be the exceptions to that. And since they're very large countries, and especially since China has a lot of interests in Africa now, uh, we, we should be keeping aware of that. But um, but it, you know, at one point, there was a lot of prospecting, exploration, considering places where new uranium mining could be opened up in Africa. And this is a list that Frank came up with uh, from, from his source here, but it's, it's all across Africa. And, and this next slide 
just shows uh, some more details. It's still way too busy for any of you. And the point is not for you to read any particular words, but just to see that there's a list. There's a lot of, of proposed projects. There's been work done on them. Many of them have not, most of them have not moved forward at all, but there was uh, consideration uh, at one time and, and uh, an enthusiasm in some circles uh, for trying to make something happen. So in that context, and starting uh, before we wrote this paper uh, in the, in the, around 2010, 2012, um, International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War organized a series of conferences in Africa. Uh, I attended the first one, which was in Mali, in uh, Bamako, Mali. And uh, I put this in for you, lovely. I changed my slides at the last minute. Uh, this is Esther Yazi, who is a Navajo woman. She and I traveled there together and gave a pair of talks. I, I talked about the science. She talked about the Navajo people's experience with uranium mining. Um, and then this is the head of the village that is in the area that was being prospected and considered for mining in Mali. And then that has not gone forward. Uh, there hasn't been a, a development of uranium mining in Mali. I don't think it had anything to do with our conference uh, probably uh, the, the story with Esther, and I'll just put my own personal story in there, is went to the conference. She and I took a day, to, a day or two to, to, to learn about the area and to, to uh, vacation after that. And then we flew back at, at night uh, to Paris, and then she went to Albuquerque. I went to Boston, um, woke up the next morning, and we had left the night before the coup in Mali. So everyone we were traveling there was, was stuck there. And of course, Mali's uh, trajectory and its future changed dramatically uh, <clears throat> with that uh, military takeover. And uh, so uh, uh, uranium mining is, I don't think, is, is back on the agenda in Mali um, at this point. And we were just, we were probably on the last airplane out of the country before that happened. Uh, next, uh, went to Tanzania for another conference. I'll show a couple of slides there. Uh, we. Uh, uh, flew into Dar es Salaam, uh, flew from there to Dodoma, and then drove uh, many hours out into the countryside to this area. And this is the, the land that would be, was, was being prospected for uranium mining. They had done, uh, drilled bores uh, into the ground to see what was down below. Uh, and, and this community near, near the mine, uh, uh, we wanted to interact with them. We wanted to educate them about uh, the challenges and, and potential hazards of uranium mining. Um, our, our tour guide was intercepted by the police, but eventually uh, released. And then uh, the next day back in Dodoma, we had uh, people from the village come in and had an all day program at which we had a long series of presentations, probably way too many presentations, uh, but they were very uh, uh, considerate and, and patient and sat through all of this as an effort to, to begin to bring some understanding to them about the legacy of uranium mining, the hazards associated with, associated with it, and so forth. Uh, and then we flew back to Dar es Salaam and did another conference there. And uh, that conference had uh, government uh, officials uh, from, the, from the Tanzanian government. And uh, uh, again, I don't know what our impact was, but hopefully it raised some concerns that uranium mining was not innocuous and, and that there were hazards associated with it. Um, finally, I went to South Africa. This is a picture of me, a little bit younger. Um, and, and we uh, toured the gold mines there. There are these massive tailing piles in South Africa from the gold mines. They have a lot of uranium ore left in those, in those tailing piles historically some of those mines were secondarily extracted for uranium, and now they're, they're consideration of, of, um, of mining, not the, not the ground, but the tailing piles uh, to, to pull out the uranium and, and extract it for commercial use. Um, again, I don't think a lot of that has happened yet, um, but my, um, my colleagues in, in South Africa, uh, you know, have sought press coverage about this. We visited people who lived on tailings piles, who lived near the tailings piles, and, and were exposed to a lot of contamination. I, I think this headline is misleading. 
the, the hazards in Chernobyl are different radioisotopes than those from uranium. But the point is that there's a, a very large radioactive and, and uranium metal a waste problem in South Africa um, that, uh, that, you know, is even just as you fly in, you can see these, these huge tailing piles from the air. So, so there's a, a uranium waste problem in, in, in Africa that has to be addressed uh, regardless. And then there's a, a question, which I think has, I, I'm less concerned about now than I was uh, five or 10 years ago, of whether there's going to be an expansion and development of more uranium mining on the continent. Um, I will say one last thing that uh, the work I've been doing most recently has been to develop, to work with uh, a fellow an inventor, an engineer in Canada, and uh, a one of the colleagues, uh, physician colleagues from Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War in Switzerland on a device uh, that would measure radon and exhaled breath. And I think this is terribly important. What, what we don't know in Africa or even in the United States and many other places is how much exposure people have had to uranium waste. And if we can get this instrument to work at a sensitive, sensitive enough level, show that it's practical to take it out in the field, then we could take it to people, to a, to a village in South Africa, for example, or to a community in, in Niger and, and, and just have someone breathe into the, the instrument for 10 minutes, and then we could tell, tell you how much radium they have in their bones. Radium is part of the uranium ore. It would give us a, a, an estimate, a pretty good estimate of lifetime exposure to uranium ore products. So, um, so I'm hopeful, you know, it's been slow. This work is slow, it's slowed down by COVID even more, but, uh, but we have made, but uh, George Vandrish, who's the engineer, has made a lot of progress. And I think I'm hopeful in the next year or two, we would have some kind of of instrument that we could bring out and and really uh, be able to, to use it for research purposes, for screening, for assessing compensation. Uh, there are compensation programs in the US and in Germany, uh, and Areva has some kind of compensation program for Africa, but I, I think it's deficient and not really providing compensation to everyone who deserves it or nor is it probably providing sufficient compensation. So uh, that's what I prepared to talk to you about today. Um, I hope that was helpful. And when we get to questions and answers, I, I'd be more than happy to, to, to answer them. I also put my email up here. And if uh, any of you who are watching uh, I would like to contact me uh, uh, directly, uh, that's, that's also fine with me. So uh, thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you very much. Um very important issues. Uh, uranium tailings is something that, you know, um, needs to be addressed. And uh, that brings up the term which I saw in Jean-Marie's um, uh, report synopsis, uh, radiological irresponsibility. You know, it's how do we uh, prevent radiological irresponsibility? You know, uh, uh, th that I think is a very important issue, um, uh, which, you know, maybe we could brainstorm how we do this. Um, and um, what I really liked in your presentation, Doug, is that, you know, you actually met with people, you know, the importance of uh, the stories. And I think that's what you based your book, uh, the um, uh, Navajo people and uranium mining. You actually um, went to the communities and you heard the stories. And that brings us to a lovely uh, and your guest speaker who will tell us a story of how uh, indigenous people in the United States cope with the decays of uranium um, mining on their land. Lovely and sunny. I think you, the floor is yours. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear and see me okay. Um, my name is Lovely Umayam, uh, and I'm speaking to you uh, from Los Angeles, California, uh, which is located on the unceded land of the Tongva, Kij, Gabrielino, and Chumash. And these are native communities who are the original custodians of the land I've, I've called home. Um, it's uh, an honor to actually speak to, to you all um, representing different countries. Uh, but before we start um, with my slides, I, I did want to offer some context as to why I'm speaking to you today. Um, I've been working on nuclear nonproliferation issues um, for almost a decade now, uh, some of which was actually spent in the US government. 
Uh, but what I will be presenting today is actually a, a very recent chapter in my personal and professional journey, uh, one that I'm still in the process of, of learning. So I come before you not as an expert on this history. Um, I think the only real experts on this topic are local communities who've experienced the impact. Um, but I'm here as a policy researcher that has come to learn about this painful history. Uh, and I want to share how I'm trying to actively use this knowledge to improve the way that I work. Um, I'll also take this opportunity to note that I have a special guest, uh, Sunny Dooley, uh, who will be joining us at the end of my discussion uh, to share some of her words as well. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen um, to uh, have my uh, presentation. Hopefully this is seamless. Great. Okay, so I um, actually wanted to start uh, with this document um, because this is one of the first primary resources um, I encountered uh, that talked directly about uranium in the United States back when I was still a student um, at Monterey <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, and this is a letter that Albert Einstein signed and sent to um, the American president at that time, uh, President Roosevelt uh, in 1939, uh, to inform him about the advent of a very powerful bomb. Uh, and this letter is famous for helping begin the Manhattan Project. Uh, but the most relevant piece here is that short sentence um, at the bottom. Uh, the United States has only very poor ores of uranium in moderate quantities. Um, and I share this uh, because for the longest time, this is the extent of the information that I learned about uranium in the United States. Um, it's a blip in history, um, often overshadowed by the larger narratives surrounding the Manhattan Project um, and the scientists and politicians who developed the bomb. Uh, there is so much more than this, um, but this is a history that's rarely included in nuclear policy education, um, and that's why I'm incredibly uh, encouraged to see this panel um, in this, uh, you know, uh, week-long, two-week-long workshop uh, for, for you all. So my presentation um, essentially will be sharing um, the, the education um, that I've gained uh, from historians, environmentalists, frontline community members in recent years that helped fill the gaps for me. So again, um, my understanding of the United States nuclear weapons legacy started with the Manhattan Project, I would pictures like this, but now um, it's also about this. Um, it's also about the land and its people um, pictured here is Mount Taylor, which is situated in New Mexico. Um, and I had the privilege of visiting it uh, for the first time in 2017. Uh, this mountain has spiritual significance to several native communities um, living in that area. Uh, and it's also the richest uranium reserve um, in the country. And this is just one of the many sites in the United States deeply affected by nuclear weapons uh, research and development. Uh, this is another sacred site that I was able to visit um, called Shiprock, uh, which is right next to a uranium mill tailing site. Um, and this is on the way to um, a place called Monument Valley, uh, which is another um, legacy uranium mining site. Um, so why, why do these places hold so much significance? And what do I mean? by this being a story about land. Um, uranium mining in the US is concentrated in a large area of land in the Southwest corner of the country, um, which is home to many indigenous communities, one of which is the Diné um, or Navajo people. Um, the Navajos are the largest native tribe in the United States with its territory spanning across three states um, and it's about 27,000 square miles. Uh, and I looked this up, it's slightly larger than the country Lithuania, just to give you um, a sense of comparison. And prior to the search for uranium, uh, this land was considered worthless because it's just, you know, uh, 
on its surface just dirt um, and desert, even when the huge native population was living and cultivating it. Um, uh, I also want to note that this is part of a larger pattern where lands used for nuclear weapons research um, uh, are often seen worthless or useless at first, um, then it becomes valuable later, uh, which is a characteristic of settler colonial practice. Uh, so the earliest mining activities in this area um, occurred in the Carrizo Mountains and as I showed you earlier, um, Monument Valley. Uh, which is at the north side of the Navajo territory. Um, and this occurred around uh, early 1940s. Uh, and I wanted to show you a map just to situate you as to where um, these activities occurred. Um, and, you know, they, we, we don't really quite know exactly to what end um, these, uh, the, the uranium was used for. It was definitely for defense related purposes. Um, but the known documents that at least I've seen um, only refer to uh, the use as, quote, atomic experimentation. Um, the uranium found here was still considered poor quality, and the government, uh, the U.S. government relied on other sources to complete the bomb. As Doug mentioned, um, uh, they heavily relied on uh, mines in, in Africa. Um, and so uh, even with that, uh, they still extracted um, a lot of, of uranium in that area. Um, I just highlighted one of the mines here, Monument Valley Number no. 2 mine, where they uh, extracted um, 3,000 pounds of uranium between 1943 uh, and 1945. Uh, today, Monument Valley is actually considered a huge tourist attraction, um, but a lot of people who visit don't know how this land has played a role in, in nuclear weapons history. Um, and then when uranium was found in the 1950s in the um, southern side of um, the area, uh, it's called Grants, and that's where the, the mountain I showed you earlier, Mount Taylor, uh, is situated. All of a sudden, this land uh, was then considered rich, <laughs> uh, and in, in, it invited a lot of um, uh, prospectors um, to, to find uranium. And the US government really encouraged it uh, and, and they called it you know, this magic ore uh, that means too much to, to the security of our nation. There's actually a lot of ads like what you see on the left-hand side um, that talked about uranium uh, in, in this way. Um, this obviously had a lot of implications on the land rights in the area, um, but it also affected the native population uh, during the uranium boom because this presented a convenient um, uh, work for them. It's, it's uh, close, closer to, to home. Uh, just a few quick facts. Um, uh, one research cited about 3,000 to 5,000 Navajo miners were employed by 1970s. Um, and according to the US Environmental Protection Agency, about uh, 30 million tons of uranium ore was extracted from Navajo land between the 40s and the 80s. Um, and that number actually fluctuates. I've seen other um, uh, documents saying 4 million. Um, the EPA website says 30 million. So um, I'd actually be curious, Doug, about some of the discrepancies um, um, that you may have seen um, in your own sort of research. Um, I also would like to take this moment to note that some researchers also like to make a distinction between mining that occurred for, quote, defense related purposes and um, how it sort of transitioned to commercial purposes, which includes um, contributions to nuclear energy. Um, but when you talk to uh, frontline communities in that area, mining is mining is mining, uh, and there is really no distinction. So I just wanted to, um, to add that. Um, uh, and as we've already talked about, um, you know, it's very hazardous work uh, even when it's shifted from underground mines to open pit um, operations, a lot of miners suffered from radiation contamination. Uh, and actually, one of Doug's extensive research on this topic really informed my knowledge, um, especially details about how there were already a lot of studies um, concerning the hazards 
um, that lead to cancers based on the European experience, um, but the United States government proceeded to neglect this existing research and did not um, institute uh, safety protocols um, or informed the workers of, of these hazards. Um, and it's not just the minors, um, also their families and the larger communities. There are a lot of anecdotes of children playing near mines and waste sites. Uh, livestock uh, drank water with high concentrations of radon, um, which decays into radon daughters. Um, uh, there are Navajo families that use debris around these um, um, mining sites. Uh, to build homes uh, and ceremonial sites, um, and they didn't know that that was the case. Um, and it's it's very difficult to pin down um, uh, the most recent statistics, uh, and perhaps Doug has a better um, understanding of the numbers here uh, concerning cancer rates, but there is one study um, in 2016 that out of 600 Navajo participants, they found 27% of those participants having um, higher levels of uranium um, in their urine compared to um, the 5% of US population as a whole. Um, and uh, just really quickly, the map on the right kind of gives you a, a different uh, uh, understanding or, or picture of, of Navajo land um, with the tiny black dots representing all of the abandoned uranium mines um, located in that area. The official count, according to the US um, EPA, is 523. Um, and I think that there are funds available to clean up about 200 of these. But I also just want to point out that local NGOs actually estimate um, about over a thousand exist um, in the land because they include other mine features. So that's also really interesting to consider the different ways of, of, of defining this. Um, and you know, there were also several um, major accidents um, during um, the uranium mining era in the United States. I'll quickly share two. Uh, there's the Mexican hat accident in 1952, uh, where a suspension bridge collapsed uh, and a truck carrying a, a load of uranium ore fell onto um, a river, the San Juan River. Um, and that is essentially an example of how uh, the government prioritized extraction, but not necessarily infrastructure um, in, in that area. And uh, what you see here on this slide is the worst nuclear accident in the history of the United States, uh, which occurred in July 16, 1979, uh, when a dam containing waste sludge from a uranium mill tailing site broke uh, and dumped over a thousand tons of waste in a river called the Perco River. Um, and it affected um, uh, a community called the Red Water Pond um, and other communities actually, um, near that site. Uh, and this um, accident is called the Church Rock Spill. Um, and I think to really understand what happened in Church Rock, I encourage you to watch the short video. Um, I'll be sure to send you a link uh, to this 12 minute video um, that features prominent community members, Edith Hood and Larry King, um, who are pictured here, um, because this is really their, their experience. Um, and it also features um, Esther Yazzie Lewis, who co-wrote that book uh, with Doug. Um, and just one last thing that I will point out here um, as a nuclear policy expert, um, I think this is, it really highlights the erasure of this history. Um, I think a lot of Americans know Three Mile Island, but if you ask them about the church rock spill, um, they probably would be like, what, what's that? Uh, they've never heard of it. Um, and at the same time, you know, nuclear experts know the date July 16 um, as the day commemorating the first uh, nuclear uh, detonation in the United States, the Trinity test, um, which was in 1945, but not necessarily the day that Church Rock occurred in 1979. So um, in the process of, of learning these histories, there is also um, a simultaneous unlearning of assumptions that we know. Um, and just really quickly now, um, 
how has this changed sort of my understanding of nuclear policy? And I think this is really the slide that I can speak to um, from experience. Uh, the first is connecting local um, to the global. Um, as policy or technical experts interested in international relations, I think we've come to um, uh, depend on a certain unit of analysis, which is countries. Um, but having this newfound knowledge um, has really challenged me to think about the pace of progress at the local level. Um, as the United States promote non-proliferation abroad or even continue to invest in modernizing nuclear weapons, I am now mindful of the types of reparations and remediations that have yet to be achieved at home, uh, which includes uh, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, as I mentioned, cleanup of these abandoned uranium mines. So there is you know, this line uh, between the local and global that I wasn't as um, uh, really aware of before. Uh, the second, just really quickly is, you know, it, it, I think, um, we, it made me reconsider uh, the meaning of security in a new light. Um, who exactly are we securing um, if these vulnerable populations continue to experience this intergenerational violence? Um, and also the future of, wor of, of this word nuclear, right? Um, in my research over the years, I've come to understand the varying meanings of nuclear from different histories and local contexts. Um, I know there are many scientists and policymakers who are very hopeful about the future of nuclear technology because of uh, yeah, advancements in, in safety and security. Um, but I think it's also incredibly important to remember that uh, not everyone's reference point is the same. Um, there are groups that are rightfully distressful, I think, because they've dealt with generations of cancers and generations of toxic landscapes. Um, for Navajo people, there isn't even um, a word in their native language for nuclear. Um, uh, and I don't think this is a failure of science, but I think the people who wield the power of that science, and as we already talked about um, this concept of um, irresponsibility. Um, and again, uh, just really quickly, um, you know, what I think is new in, um, the, uh, in this space. Uh, is the intentional thinking and articulation of how this history is part of nuclear non-proliferation policy. So, so now when I conduct my work, um, I ask these three questions. Um, how can I learn from um, and partner with frontline communities? Uh, how can I cite Native scholars? How can I cite scholars that have come before me? Um, also, how can I be more mindful of this history when I talk about nuclear non-proliferation abroad? Um, paying attention to the local progress is now very important to me. Um, and also, how can we infuse environmental stewardship and policy discussions? We tend to separate, oh, that's more environmental remediation or, oh, that's not really nuclear, but it, it is part of the history. Um, and I think it will actually be very helpful to us in the future or really now as we think about the intersection of climate change um, and uh, you know the work that, that we do. Um, with that, I actually would like to pass the mic if she's available to a friend of mine, Sunny Dooley, who is a Navajo storyteller. Um, and she's really the first person who um, really encouraged me to look into my humanity as a nuclear policy expert uh, to um, learn these things. So I don't know if, if Sunny, if you're um, available to, to give a few words now. And Sunny, you have to unmute yourself. You're muted. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yes, a Africa, do Hashine Lanke Yapuka, that is in a Frangi. A Shah Quadi, Binibi, a Sahni Long, Sabe Yadel Tiki, so Nantin, the Idahil Ahagi, a Taisi, Jonago, the Nose, do Bates, Eid Ahodoni, Winsen, Go Eyaqui, a Sahni Tle. She had put a conjured in the Enishle, Tapa Habashishin. Kia ani da shi che, a do in da tan ha pek ni eya da shi nala. Da da is apa gaan da shi che, bich na hol da shi wal ya, 
Abe eya asana nishlo eya kui dije khane beni khane ya. It's a real honor and privilege to address every single one of you who are in audible zone of hearing my voice. It's a real privilege to be with you today to share a few thoughts about what this really is. I want to begin by saying these words by Sonia Renee Taylor. She spoke these very powerful words not too long ago, and this is what she said. We will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal other than that we normalized greed, inequality, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return, my friends. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature. These words were taken from a talk that was titled, Overgrow the System. And just to point out, 400,000 people have died in the United States of the Corona-19 virus. When you think about that number, that would have eradicated my entire native Navajo nation. We would not be in existence. We would have been wiped clean in one year from the face of the earth. Transpose that onto the nuclear uranium disasters. We are living with a 70 year legacy of environmental and human, animal, bird, reptile, insect degradation. The reason why we were so susceptible to this coronavirus was because we have a 70 year health issue that has given so many of our elders, the shortest lease on life with this virus. I've been to Africa, I've been to Togo, to a small village called Chamba about 22 years ago. I felt like I visited my mother's childhood and growing up. There was no electricity and there was no water on how my mom grew up. I grew up with electricity in my house installed in 1979, the same year that the church rock spill happened into the Rio Perco. It's on par with Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. That was how big of a disaster it was. I was a junior in school at the time. What limited knowledge that I had about radioactivity, I translated terribly into Navajo because we have no words that exist for this condition. And I had to tell all of my elders and families, extended families that lived near the Rio Perco Arroyo, that they could not be harvesting and butchering the sheep for food and sustenance. And I remember an elder looking at me and she said, for how long? And I had to say, almost for forever, grandmother, because the the sheep, if they drink that water, they are ruined. And if we eat that sheep, we are ruined and we will die. That area now has a very large cluster of cancers. So don't get lost in the policy talk. Don't get lost in the technology talk. Don't ever divorce yourself from your communities. 
because the conversation needs to begin about healing. We need to get well. We need to divest ourselves of thinking that military policy might is peace. It is not. Those are the words I share with you today because I am living in the 70 year, year legacy of this horrible process of uranium mining. It's terrible. And maybe nobody will say it to you that bluntly, but I am brave enough to say that to you. Please remember the words of Sonia Renee Taylor. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and all of nature. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Sunny, um, for your presence here. Um, and thank you to, to everyone for, for listening to our presentation. Um, I know we went a little bit over time, um, but I wanted to share this last slide that I have just highlighting um, the resources um, that really helped me uh, gain more um, education uh, about this topic, which includes Doug's book, um, the book Waste Landing, uh, and very recently the Uranium Atlas that was um, published uh, last year. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just want to end my, my talk by saying thank you so much. Um, if you want to um, be uh, in touch with me uh, about this topic, um, uh, I'll make sure to, to share my email. Um, and Sunny and I, um, along with uh, several artists, Carmel Garcia, who actually took those photos um, at the front end of my presentation, Kayla Briet, who is a director that we're working with, um, as well as Adriel Lewis. Uh, we have an art project uh, coming up uh, that highlights um, these histories called Ways of Knowing. Uh, so with that, uh, I yield the floor back to Margarita. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you. Um, what a powerful way to uh, conclude the session, um, which we had today, government that feeds all the humanity, you know, some of the problems may, may be unique to the countries, but we have a universal um, um, goal, I think, you know, to make sure that um, we address nuclear legacies. And uh, I think, as we mentioned, uh, we could put this in different perspectives and different views and experiences, but I think we have to take responsibility uh, for that. And we could do it um, through a um, number of ways. And I think we, um, today I see this panel as sharing knowledge about the, you know, these issues. Uh, it's, uh, and one of you could take away whatever you want um, uh, here. So we have several questions and um, I uh, want to thank the panelists again for this uh, powerful and uh, educational and in informative uh, presentations. Um, we uh, have um, eight questions and we would like to ask our panelists, of, I'm sorry, participants to ask them in person. And I have Rose Anodja, who is the first who addressed her question. And I believe that Jean uh, promoted her, promoted, made her um, a panelist so she could ask it in person, if you wish so, Rose. Um, okay, uh, so, um, Jean was up, did you? Uh, she is. Um, she's listed okay. as, uh, as a panelist. She should. She, she should just turn her microphone on and speak. Rose, if you would like to. Okay. Good evening, and uh, thank you for your presentation. Yes, the question I have here is uh, to know how how frequent is the uranium mining activity in US in US is being monitored, and also I want to know if there is any encouragement as to the peaceful use of this nuclear material. Thank you. And I, I think I would welcome the input from all panelists, uh, if you, whoever wants to start first. 
Um, I'll, I'll just say one thing. Uh, there's there's very little uranium mining in the U.S. currently, uh, and there hasn't been for decades. Um, at one time, there was a lot of uranium mining going on, and, and Lovely covered uh, some of that very nicely. Um, but in recent years, very little. There are a few mines here and there. There are, as I said in my talk, there is there are ideas about starting new uranium mining that have been on been kicked around for a long time and there has been opposition and there's been controversy about it, but very little has been started. Um, I think in terms of how well, if what uranium mining is happening and if new uranium mining started, it would be much better regulated than it was in the 1950s and 60s, but I think there's still a lot of concern. My, mining, mining of anything is a messy activity and can leave a lot of, of waste and hazards behind. Uh, does anybody else want to comment? Lovely. Can you hear lovely. me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. This is Sunny. Uh, this is Sunny Dooley, and I just want to say that there are always many uranium companies uh, shape shifting under different acronyms of names that are always trying to restart uranium mining around Mount Taylor area, which is a sacred site to uh, many of the native pueblos and nations that live in Arizona and New Mexico. And so um, right now, Holtec um, wants to go into the Southern area of New Mexico and Texas and uh, start another uranium dump. Um, and around Grant, New Mexico, um, it's always interesting how old uranium companies morph into different uranium companies and then always try to persuade elected political officials uh, to restart uranium mining that uranium mining has contaminated much of the water sources um, and wells, water wells, um, and even artesian springs deep in the earth. And because I live on the western side of the Continental Divide, where all the waters go into the Pacific Ocean, uh, this particular mountain range is on the west east side, excuse me, east side of the Continental Divide, and they drain into eventually what would be the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean with, within various river bodies. And so it's very, very important to know your geographical uh, locations of all of your countries. Uh, forget about the political boundary lines, but look at Earth Mother and all of her features and discover where the waste is eventually going to end up. That's all. Thank you very much, Asani, for your uh, thoughtful remarks uh, to that question. Uh, if nobody else wants, Jean, did you, Jean Marie, did you want to say something or can we proceed? So um, there was another question which we received uh, in the, and we are looking at them at the order they were received. It's from the anonymous attendee, so I'm going to read it. Why has there been no, no much international pressure to France uh, to decontaminate the sites at uh, Rijan and Aker in uh, Algeria? Until today, 20,000 people still live there. Is this why France will not sign the uh, TPNW treaty? Because it requires state parties take responsibility to provide assistance to affected parties. And I think Jean Maria will start with you. <laughs> since it... <laughs> okay, the, the question is really good. Why there were not so much intention on Algeria if you compare with all the attention that was realized on Polynesia? And one of the main reasons is because France realized only 17 nuclear tests in the 60s. Um, France also never wanted to speak about Algeria and mostly opened some doors about Polynesia. 
it's also, I would say, a little bit the fault of NGOs, maybe, because it was easier, uh, I would put some comma on easier, to focus on Polynesia, uh, because uh, we have the capacity to go there, to try to uh, engage some protest, to meet some people, that we didn't have this capacity with Algeria. Also, the Algerian government clearly also closed the door about this topics because it's also a page of their history that they didn't want to speak until now they began to speak. Because as I said in my presentations, uh, they accepted that France realized 11 nuclear tests. I suppose that they didn't have any choice. So that's why they accepted also to authorize this test during this period because what they wanted in 1960s, 1962 was their independence. So they probably say, okay, we accept to let you this piece of land during a few years. Uh, but it's also, they know also that it's a kind of, I would say, shame that they authorized to destroy their own land. Um, so for all of this reason, at the end, until now, we never really talk about Algeria. Also, you know, the, the, we really have a, a very, uh, I would say, a difficult story, story between France and Algeria. And each time you begin to speak about a topic about Algeria in France, you are immediately targeted as someone who is against France or too much in favor of Algeria, even if it's not the question. The question is health. The question is environment, nothing more. So that's probably one of the main reasons. For sure, actually, France is not going to sign and or ratify the TPNW. And it's not the, the questions of Algeria and the remediations of the, of the seats. It's more because France trusts on a nuclear deterrence and France just wants to, uh, to continue this nuclear deterrence security. So it's absolutely not linked with, the, with what is going to happen on Algeria. But a certitude is that the Algerian topic with the nuclear waste that France led it's going to open the door, and that's what is the most important. It's going to open the door to a discussion and to some debates inside the French Parliament about that and about the TPNW. Just before you, that's why I arrived just right on time, I was with uh, the Vice President of the Senate of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and we spoke about these questions. And he said, I would try to open, I would, we are going to spoke about this topic with the angle of the Algeria um, waste, not about the, the, the angle with the TPNW. It would be easier to speak on, on nuclear deterrence topic and nuclear disarmament topics. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Jean-Marie. And there is actually a follow-up question um, on the same topic. Uh, uh, do you know of any studies which were done by the Algerian uh, side on the impacts of nuclear tests? Uh, there is not some official status. I know that some doctors uh, in Tamar Nahaset create their own report, but something really official and something that uh, that we can really uh, believe, with realize with very good uh, samples and statistics, were for the moment not or available or realized. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Jean Jean Dupri. Did you have a question? You said that you want to answer live. No, I don't have a question. Oh, okay, well, it says that you want to answer it like that. I'm sorry. So I'll, I'll proceed to the next question. And um, I invite Linda uh, Mugogo uh, to, um, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your names. Um, would you like to ask your question live, please? You are now, you, you could speak now. It's the question about Malawi. Um, Margarita, I suggest you ask the question, please. Okay. Um, in Malawi, uh, at Kanika, there was found niobium of economic value, but uh, could uranium be mined as any product? How best can the country regulate the mining of uranium as byproduct to ensure peaceful use? Um, so I think it's, I guess, anybody could answer, I mean, uh, if you have any comments to that, or uh, maybe I should, um, so basically can, um, countries regulate the mining of uranium and um, and I think they do um, but, but uh, so I don't know if, if Linda wants to clarify that she could oh, yeah she raised your hand so uh, yes please please you could speak with Linda you could yeah you have to unmute yourself <laughs> yes <laughs> Basically, what I, what I want to 
learn on that uh, in Malawi, we have an existing uranium mine, the, which is currently under care and maintenance. But at Kanyika, it is a bit different from the, the existing uranium mine that we have. The, the Kanyika one, the main product that will be mining is the uh, niobium, but they have found also uranium, which it is being proposed that they will be mining niobium, but uranium will be a byproduct. So to my thinking is that it is hard to monitor the uranium as a byproduct because it wants to be in a variable quantity according to the one that will venture into the mining of niobium. So maybe they may not take care of it, or they may not uh, account for it. As such, it could re easily be misused uh, by the, the company that could be employed to mine the uranium that it is at Kanyiga. So my worry much is about um, the, the, the current legal infrastructure in the country, and even the other neighboring countries, there's no any country that have uh, rose as the gas to how we can regulate the mining of uranium as a byproduct. At the same time, most of the countries, they are also, our neighbors are also into the exploration of uranium, but at the same time, they also don't have the legal infrastructure where we can also learn how best we can control the mining of the uranium as a byproduct so that we can ensure the security of the uranium that will be, will, will be a byproduct, it, it should be secure, so that it should not be used for non-peaceful uses, such as the weapons uh, to aid as a raw material for the weapons development. So basically, that's what I wanted to learn, if uh, there's uh, that kind of experience in any country where they are mining the uranium as a byproduct and they have better legal infrastructure where we can learn from. Thank you. Thank you. Any takers? Um, yeah, I'll say something. I, you know, so the uranium as it's mined immediately after it's mined, the ore is not, does not have the potential to be used in a nuclear power plant, let alone in nuclear weapons. And it has to be, it has to be purified and then it has to be enriched. And the level of enrichment for nuclear power is a lower level of enrichment than for nuclear weapons. So, so really, um, the, the, the issue of nuclear proliferation of nu the, uh, increased uh, nuclear weapons is down the road and requires a substantial technological intervention with the uranium, uh, after the uranium ore before that becomes an issue. And, and you can see this, uh, look at uh, Iran, that whatever your view of the situation there, the debate has been over and over again, Jean Marie, I think you would agree with me, has been over and over, what level are they enriching the uranium for, to, right? And if it's just enough for nuclear power or to, to, to make, uh, and, and to use that to make medications, isotopes for medications, then it's not, then it's probably not gonna be an issue for, for, for weapons. But if it's at a higher level of enrichment, then maybe it could be. And the very same technology that allows you to enrich for nuclear power, if you take it further, can be used to enrich for weapons. So, so it's really at that much later stage that you have to worry about a uranium being used in a, uh, for weapons. Did I say anything wrong, Jean-Marie? Okay. No, 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 perfect. Okay, good. I, yeah, it's a little bit out of my core area of expertise, but I think I knew it. Uh, can I just echo um, that? Uh, I, uh, yeah, I also want to emphasize um, Doug's point that there are many, many steps in between mining uranium and developing a nuclear weapon. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I'm just mindful of as a non-proliferation expert, again, comes from the frontline communities um, and, and their history with uranium mining, at least within Navajo Nation, there was definitely a, a point in which the, my, uh, the uranium was used for um, 
for defense related purposes. And then there was a phase in which it was just for what, you know, the field, our field would call peaceful purposes. But I just want to highlight that when you're talking to frontline communities, that distinction um, gets very blurry. Um, and I think that that's one of the complexities of working in the field, that peaceful use, even when it's for energy or agricultural research or um, medicine, uh, it's just making sure that uranium practices across the board is safe um, and secure and uh, has a lot of community input. And then historically, because of the, the existing problems that a lot of um, native people and other people um, uh, in other countries that have experienced mining, they're still trying to fight for rights. They're still trying to fight for, um, for justice in, in receiving care. Um, that also needs to be addressed too in order to have a much more holistic understanding, elevated and improved understanding of what we're really saying when we're talking about peaceful uses. So hopefully that's, it, it, it is very nuanced. It's very complicated. Um, and as a nuclear policy person, it's, it's very difficult to make that distinction. We, we have a lot of questions, um, uh, so I, uh, I will address one more. Uh, I combined several questions in one, uh, and I apologize to speakers. Some of them you may not be able to ask it in person. Um, one of the questions that came from several participants is that, are there any uh, policies or uh, procedures in place to ensure the safety of uh, workers who work at the uranium mines? And uh, you know, if you could just uh, maybe uh, give a very uh, brief uh, answer to that question. Uh, several participants asked that. Well, um, oh, go ahead. I know in Niger, for example, where uh, we have one of the main companies named Areva, we, uh, we have some mine on, uh, on, on, radio, on, on rocks who are radioactive. They have some rules and they normally they should protect the, the, the workers with some specific tools, like some specific clothes, for example. Uh, they also install some, uh, normally they should have installed some hospital to check their health. So that's one of the rules that they, 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 they realize. But to be honest, I'm not sure it's completely realized at 100%. How about that? You're on mute. I'm on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, anybody else wants to uh, contribute to this answer? Uh, my apologies. My, my sense from what I've heard about the situation in Africa is that the level, I, I think it's consistent with what Jean Marie was saying that. The level of protection for workers is is very rudimentary, and 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 more. My impression is it's more like what things were like, um, lovely and sunny, sunny back in you know 40 or 50 years ago in the U.S. when there were some there was something, but not nearly enough. And especially, let me just make one point really clear for underground workers, workers in underground mines. Radon is the is the massive concern. And and you can't just put you can't just do that through clothing or washing your clothes afterwards. You have to have ventilation in the mines, and it has to be changing the air and diluting the radon and reducing the concentration. That's that's the only thing that's going to work. Um, and I doubt that that exists to an adequate level uh, in most of the in most locations. Not not just in Africa, but probably in in, in Central Asia and other places as well. <laughs> 